thank you so much. And I want to thank everybody who is joining us. And uh, I trust that some of, uh, this is uh, our third panel and I see some uh, famous, uh, some famous and uh, some uh, uh, faces that have been, uh, that have been uh, with us before. And I really thank you for your loyalty to our program and support of uh, uh, Ruth Table Gallery. So uh, I, uh, the artists that we have today in, on our third panel are uh, Leah Cook, Teddy Milder, and Naomi Kramer. So I will begin immediately with the first question. And I would like to ask Leah to uh, introduce uh, to introduce herself the way she wants us to know about her. And I will give you about one minute. Okay, well, um, um. I just wanted to introduce myself and um, I think the most important thing for me is my process, my creative process over the years. And um, I grew up in a time that was very easy to be creative, explore and so forth. So. Okay, thank you. Next please, uh, Naomi Kramer. Same question. Okay. Or the same uh, request. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm a painter and a video artist, and I also draw. And uh, the thing that I most uh, enjoy is the experience of no boundaries between media and the uh, cross fertilization of the different media that I use into each other. And I find that process incredibly creative and generative. Okay. Uh, uh, Teddy Milder, please. Hi, I want to thank you, Hannah and, and Ruth Table for inviting us um, to this to be in the exhibition. Um, I came to a full time art practice later in my life, although I uh, had studios and 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 uh, part time art practice throughout. So I had this whole other career until about 15 years ago. So, um, I work uh, primarily with fiber of fiber techniques, but I think what's exciting to me is that I use lots of different kinds of non-traditional materials and my curiosity and trying to figure out how to make those materials work is what excites me. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, I would like the uh, in the same order, so I will start with Leah and tell us about your earliest memory of becoming an artist and when did you know you wanted to be an artist? How was it nurtured and nourished? So uh, I basically grew up in an environment where art was always accepted in the family. My mother had been an art major at Cal in the 30s. And uh, so we just did art as a part of our life. All of us did. We didn't think of it as a career. We, think, we thought of it as an everyday part of our life. Um, and uh, my mother was wonderful about letting me be myself. So she didn't want to control me and make me into a 50s, 40s woman. <laughs> she uh, wanted me to enjoy myself and, and to just explore and be creative. And so I feel very, very lucky about that. And uh, the things that turned me on uh, to eventually to being an artist, uh, I wanted to do something creative. Uh, I knew I couldn't dance, I couldn't sing very well. I didn't have a good ear for music. Uh, and my brother was considered the artist, you know, the artist in the family. So I had to find something different. So I wanted to be an actress and that's what I did for quite a long time. Uh, just totally focused on being an actress. But at some point um, I uh, had uh, got somebody uh, in political science who just had the most interesting class. So I went to Berkeley and I had this professor who let me take whatever I wanted and I could take, so it was political science, but I could take anthropology, I could study Africa, all over the world. There were so many things that I could do. And I also showed slides for art history classes. So I had a huge background in art history. And so, Anyway, eventually I got 
you know, I got out of the acting thing and into, and I always also took painting and did that at Cal uh, all the time I was there. So at, at some point I brought it together with textiles. And I, when I traveled to Mexico, I saw so many wonderful uh, indigenous people weaving. And so I, when I came back to Berkeley, I kind of put the things together and- um, Okay. Okay, let me just move on to Naomi. Naomi, can you, thank you for, for that background. And now let me just move to Naomi. Hi. Um, so uh, I uh, really drew and uh, enjoyed drawing and uh, I enjoyed writing, especially also writing the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, which was my first language. Um, so as a child, I just drew, uh, but nobody really paid much attention to me as an artist and it wasn't particularly encouraged, I would say. Uh, and then uh, when I uh, started high school, uh, there was an amazing uh, studio art teacher who encouraged me um, and uh, my friend and I were allowed the run of the stock room and we just uh, cut a bunch of classes and drew and painted and um, explored. Uh, but I was never really supposed to be an artist because it was not a secure career. So in college, I minored in art. Uh, but again, I had a job as the studio manager. So I was in the studio more than anybody because <laughs> uh, I was there to open the door and I was there to lock the door and I was there in between. Uh, so many, many hours in the studio. Um, and then I had a sideways career, um, or at least I should say a digression uh, into the uh, graphic design world. I had a graphic design business for a few years. Uh, and then at the age of 36, so kind of ra rather late, uh, I just felt, uh, had a realization that I was kind of in the wrong life and uh, decided to sell my business. I had a gra little graphic design business and uh, rented a studio and started painting. And um, after uh, a year or two of that, I thought I'd better go to grad school so I can get into the conversation and figure out how people talk about art and meet people who make art and, you know, make that part of my life. And, um, and here I am. Okay, well, thank you for that. And Teddy, please tell us about your journey. Sure, um, well, my mom was an artist. Um, and so uh, like, uh, Leah, I was surrounded by her drawings and we would draw together all the time, although she wound up having a career in banking. So, um, and most of my family, I mean, I didn't realize that this was unusual because it was just how we grew up. Most of my family were artistic or had musical talent. There were many musicians and I was a dancer. I danced when I was young and all the way recently stopped dancing. Um, so, so I was from a family with many working hands and many different levels. There, of course, was my grandmother that was a practiced the domestic arts and was an amazing embroiderer and so forth. Um, and I had an aunt that um, uh, collected art and had a small gallery that's where she sold prints. So even though I had all this around me, I didn't really think that I could have a career as an artist and have it be viable. I don't, it just never uh, occurred to me. Um, and so I followed a different path. And by the time I graduated from Columbia in New York with a degree in nursing, I realized that what I really wanted to do was to make art. Um, it was kind of fortunate for me though, because for many, many years I worked part-time and I was able to have a stable income and have a studio and practice my art. So, um, and, you know, I was the kid that made her all of her own clothes. I tear apart her, you know, hand-me-downs and reconstruct them and make costumes for theater productions and so forth. So it was always there. It just wasn't, um, wasn't a full-time endeavor and I didn't go to school to get a degree in art. Um, so my life experience was my art okay. studies. Okay, that leads me to the, the question and it's you, uh, I, it's you, Teddy, and I want you to talk about uh, the two pieces that are in the exhibition. Sure. Uh, so um, break it down for, for us in terms of process or whatever is interesting about that. And uh, then uh, I, uh, some of the pieces you created while you were in an artist in residency program. So I want you, and especially when you were in, um, 
in Mexico, and I'm very interested if, and I think everybody else will be interested to know about artists in residency outside of this country. Sure. Well, this, this piece, um, which is the, uh, an older piece of mine, um, was inspired by a trip. I was staying in Sevilla, Spain, and I was wandering um, the streets of the old city, um, the cobbled um, street and the rough walls. And um, I was searching for the museum of uh, flamenco because at that point I had been studying flamenco dance for about 10 years. And I was lost and just enjoying the, the wandering and saw this incredible wall. This is an image, a photograph that I took that was right near the museum, as it turns out. And so it was so mysterious and was so compelling that I wound up printing. The technique I was using at the time was to print on alternative materials. So I printed this photograph on recycled soda cans. And I had been working out how to do this for a while, um, but didn't really put it together about how I was going to present it or how it could turn into a full body of work. So I stitched it together with wire and that became my first metal quilt. Um, but more importantly, this piece spawned a series that um, I keep going back to after 10 years, which was based on circles and squares and black and white. And um, I spent a lot of time working in all kinds of media, playing with, with those constraints. And um, so that's, that's the story of this mysterious image. Okay, next one. Um, what Just was- the second, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go to so the second. The, the interesting thing was this was um, a wall and I didn't realize that I would return to the concept of wall um, many years later. And um, that became a, a, a whole other series. And that brings us to Oaxaca. Okay. This is a triptych. Uh, and uh, it is called Wall Constructions. And this story is that I arrived in Oaxaca for an artist residency the day after uh, Trump was elected. And it was a very strange and surreal experience to be in Mexico literally the day after he was elected. And I, you know, everyone was kind of in shock and numb. And most Oaxacans really felt that the border wall was going to be built next week. So the concept of, uh, or the prospect of a wall being built was just loomed large and sort of began um, what was going to be this process of my working through what walls would mean and what walls were historically and how I could process that through this art residency. Um, so again, I wandered the streets, I wandered the countryside, I was photographing ancient and contemporary walls and crumbling walls and graffiti walls. And it was kind of an antidote for me to the Trump's threat of building a wall. And it allowed me to explore what walls meant and the history of walls in this other country. Um, I found comfort and inspiration in the beauty and the history of Oaxacan walls. They helped me explore the ways artists built and responded to walls now and in the past. I began to see walls um, as a conceptual process in multiple ways. They weren't just physical barriers. They could be bridges. They were elements of support and provided shelter. And of course, they were a surface for murals, art, and communication. People would post things and protest. So this was um, three large uh, uh, pieces of paper. I was primarily working, uh, making paper in Oaxaca. I worked in a fantastic workspace, a paper workshop in a small town above uh, Oaxaca that was a converted cotton mill by the Mexican artist Francisco Toledo. 
And there was a small paper making workshop there where I got to work. It was very rustic and I made lots and lots of paper. And um, on, on the other days I would wander through the streets and um, get to work with other artists. I took natural dye classes. I joined a group called Stitches and Bitches, which was a group of uh, women that met and stitched uh, together weekly on any kind of thing that they wanted. Um, and I think that I went home then with all these images and all this nourishment and with the understanding that um, fiber art and, and was so highly valued in that area. I mean, there's just a rich, rich, long history of the importance of fiber art or the, what's now termed the domestic arts. Um, so I came home and I printed the imagery on my handmade paper and then added my stitch. Um, and I sort of saw that as adding an enhancement, adding a bridge between the US and the United States so that my hand would maybe delicately help to mend the US border um, policies. Thank you so much. Now I move to uh, Naomi Kramer and Naomi, the same thing. I want you to talk about the selection of the two pieces that are represented in the exhibition and with the maybe a little bit of elaboration how memory uh, runs through many of your work is a, and is a source of one of your inspirations. Okay, um, so, <clears throat> so this painting is called From Memory. Um, the title, by the way, typically comes after I make the work. I don't set out to, uh, you know, with the title and then illustrating that title. So um, this piece kind of brings together uh, a lot of my fascinations, concerns, obsessions uh, in one rather small, it's relatively small for me because I, I tend to work big. Uh, it's only 42 inches by 42 inches. Um, so it also it's um, so the, the some some of the things that come together here are my fascination with color, um, the um, uh, structure of the work, um, the uh, references to art history as well as personal history. So um, the the use of little paintings inside. A larger painting, uh, which is done uh, quite a bit, um, uh, certainly in, in many of the paintings that I love. I mean, Matisse, uh, Picasso, there are often small paintings quoted in the, in the little paintings, uh, sorry, in the larger painting. Um, so in a way, the, the real heart of this picture for me is the, two, or, uh, the small picture of the two little figures uh, on the right side. Um, Hannah, maybe you can point to it. Uh, can you see it? No, you have, can you move your marker there? That's it. Yeah. Um, so that one uh, is uh, um, modeled after a, a photograph of my sister and I when we were small children. Uh, and I had an album uh, of very few uh, photographs actually from my childhood. And this was one of them. Uh, and uh, I guess I, uh, as I became an artist, as I continued to work. Uh, I was very uh, curious about how uh, my childhood ended up um, morphing into this um, adult uh, who could make art and wanted to make art and was able to, to work as an artist. Uh, so I kind of uh, would look at this picture and, and uh, try to see hints of that somehow in that small child, you know, just what, what who was that person? Uh, and then as you move around the painting, uh, like right above it, there's uh, another small painting that has some handwriting. If you could move down, uh, Hannah, could you pull it down a little? Uh, so it's kind of yellow um, there. Uh, the, the tall rectangle has uh, looks like an E there and an M, a fragment of an N. Uh, so that was another of my early um, um, interests was in handwriting. Uh, and uh, I always hated my handwriting, actually. You know, I, I, I was just sort of out of control somehow. And, you know, it wasn't regular and beautiful. Uh, but then as I became an artist, I came to realize that, um, and actually when I taught art, what I would tell students is that um, in a way uh, uh, your strongest um, work is what is your handwriting because it can't be anything but what it is. You know, it's really uh, almost impossible to change one's handwriting. And uh, it's going to be authentic because it'll be the way you do things and not the way anybody else does things. So that uh, little excerpt of uh, uh, handwriting refers to that. 
Uh, and then moving over to the left, there's a, a small rectangle with red and yellow in it. And that one for me uh, refers to abstract painting. Uh, the abstract expressionists were a big part of my um, education. I did a, a master's in uh, art history and my uh, specialty was abstract expressionism. Uh, and people have uh, often um, referred to my work as being kind of abstract expressionist which you know I don't mind but I also resent a little bit because there's all this baggage um, with abstract expressionism you know that it was kind of male macho um, and for me it's got nothing to do with that you know it's just um, the fact that the painting is abstract and it's also I guess you could say expressionistic meaning uh, it's not geometric um, so uh, and then there are also a reference. So the, the combination of references to the figure to nature, there's a little window with some grasses growing in it. There's a feeling of water in this painting. Um, so uh, it combines my interest in abstraction, figuration and nature. Uh, and I'm constantly kind of going back and forth between focusing on whether it's uh, for a while, it's going to be mostly nature based. And when I say nature, I mean also a uh, um, molecular structure, you know, that's part of nature or fractals, uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the cosmos, you know, uh, down to the uh, small detail of a leaf, you know, that kind of relationship uh, for me is all also part of nature, uh, as well as the current, uh, you know, the, the issues that we're facing now with, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the embattlement of nature uh, and our, uh, need to stop attacking uh, nature, basically. Um, okay. And um, I guess that's it. Can you move now to the second, can we move now to the second work, which is one of your more, more yeah. recent and it's still work in progress? Yes, so this um, is a new project uh, based on Stefan Mallarmé's uh, uh, poem, A Tomb for Anatole. Anatole was his uh, eight-year-old son who uh, died of, uh, at the age of eight. Uh, and uh, Mallarmé wrote a series of poems uh, dedicated to people he admired, uh, and he would call them a tomb to such and such. So this one was a tomb uh, to Anatole. Uh, it was an unfinished poem. Uh, and this project came together um, because I was in Marseille last summer uh, for Manifesta. I was participating with the work. And uh, I met uh, a music producer called Michel Pastor who loves my work and has gotten me involved in making video for various performance works that he's doing. Um, so this uh, is a new project that uh, is, we're collaborating with the uh, composer, uh, Pierre Tillois, and um, we will be uh, at a residency in uh, June in uh, the South France to develop this piece, which will be performed in Marseille in December of 2021. Uh, so the imagery in this piece uh, is uh, mostly taken, uh, well, it combines uh, a video I shot of myself walking down a long, long, long hallway. Uh, and uh, the title of this piece uh, at one stage was So Far, uh, which has uh, many meanings. It means, uh, you know, it refers to me, uh, uh, for me to how far one has come, how far one has to go. Uh, so far is also a measure of time, you know, so far this is such and such. Uh, the background is a combination of, um, now this, you're just seeing about a, a, you know, a GIF, so it's like a six second fragment, uh, but this uh, entire piece is about five and a half minutes and it will be one of the sec segments that goes into this um, work. Uh, so the rest of the footage is from, Af that I shot in Africa and um, uh, water and um, vegetation and stuff like that. So I think I've probably talked long enough. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now I move to Leah and Leah, please uh, speak about your uh, two pieces and start with the uh, Florentine fresco. <clears throat> okay, uh, well, uh, this is a piece of work. I think this is 1992, uh, but it's uh, uh, developed from a series of work that I did in the 80s. Um, and all of my work is woven. I have weaving as part of all of it. But I also, in this case, it's, it's like a painting in three layers. So it's a painting and it's woven and it's painted before it's woven and painted afterward. Anyway, that's the, the process. And it's run through a big etching press and I put in water and flattened out. So it has a kind of, a, uh, 
reflective surface when you move by it, the patterns change and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot of my interest in uh, the connection between weaving and painting. And uh, I started uh, working with uh, woven, instead of just a regular canvas, I would weave a canvas uh, out of uh, rayon and put it in water and put it flat and use it as a canvas to paint on. Uh, but as I began working more, I began to be, look at a lot of paintings and it seemed like in a lot of, from everything from Renaissance paintings to uh, just lots of historical paintings. I, I spent a year in Europe and traveled and saw a lot of, uh, you know, historical paintings and museums and there was so much drapery. I mean, the painting was almost all cloth and yet it wasn't about cloth. It wasn't the subject matter. It was just the supportive thing. So the idea that textiles are a sort of supportive thing rather than a, a, sen, a essential thing. So um, this, uh, this is a detail from, um, I spent uh, a summer in Florence uh, actually studying uh, old jacquard weaving processes, but at the same time, I was able to see a lot of things uh, paintings and this particular fresco. And uh, again, so I took it, I took details from paintings and uh, then repainted them and wove them and so forth, but mainly making the drapery as the subject matter. Uh, and that was, uh, I, I guess I started out working with making woven domestic objects. So it was a, a part of the time when, you know, women's work, uh, I was in a textile field, which was a wonderful field to be able to explore in and try all kinds of different things. And also look at the history, uh, the broad cultural history, not just European history of art, but the broad cultural history of art from many countries, from Africa and South America, and, uh, and all of these people that did textiles uh, as, as an art, art form. So um, I really wanted to make uh, drapery in this case, but sometimes domestic objects as subject matter. And then I moved from this to doing uh, uh, details from the old masters and the old mistresses. And so I did a lot of uh, work around, uh, again, taking drapery. Eventually I did, uh, I looked at the touch of the hand on the drapery, on the body, and eventually moved up the body to working with faces. So in my next one, we can talk about that. Okay, so let's move to your to your Sue series, and also uh, please make your comments a little bit shorter and talk about uh, the collaboration. Okay, well, uh, the Sue series is uh, based on the experience I had of uh, translating an image, in this case, an image of myself as a young child. Uh, differently in weaving over and over again. And each time people would look at these, not only would they have a strong emotional response, but they also, everyone seemed different. So this one's sad, this one's angry. And so I started doing this piece called the Sioux series, which is ended up being 32 pieces, but it, originally it was gonna be a hundred and each one was different. And so, the important part of it is people's emotional response when they see the work. Because when you see a photograph, it, it's different than when you see it woven. When you see it woven, there's a whole tactile, you wanna be able to touch it and you can't touch it. And there's this whole sort of emotional response to the uh, textile. And so um, I, I, I went to uh, work with neuroscientists to look at this. And I did a lot of studies with different 
neuroscientists looking at comparing what the emotional response was when you looked at a photograph as compared to a woven of the same image. So I did a lot of research, uh, worked with a number of different neuroscientists. Uh, and then uh, uh, I, I, I brought that imagery back into my work. But one of the neuroscientists I ran into was uh, this Tim Timothy Elmore, and he was working on imaging of the neural connections in the brain. So something that I didn't wanna do at all. I wasn't interested in weaving a brain, but when I saw the imagery that was just out, it was out a couple of weeks when I saw it, uh, that it looked like a weaving, so I had to do it. So I went and had my brain scanned and so forth and so on. So, and, and that's all woven back into the pieces. So this 32 pieces incorporates a number of these things, the neural connections in my brain, the, some of the data visualization from the emotional studies. So I think it was about eight or 10 years I worked with neuroscientists uh, uh, and incorporated it into my work. So. It's definitely a monumental work. And now, uh, Naomi and Leah, you understand why I try to pair you together and bring you into this panel. And it's because both of you having that experience of uh, uh, collaborating. So maybe in, uh, in, uh, in one minute or a few sentences, uh, tell us uh, how does the col collaboration expand and enhance um, your work? Where would you be without that collaboration? Well, for me, it's just, uh, as I said, these unexpected things that happen when you collaborate. You, you, you start to collaborate and you have a particular idea, but if you're working with another person, they bring their ideas to it. And so I, what I like about it is the new things that happen, the unexpected things, the directions you didn't plan to go in, uh, and, and then, you know, sort of bringing that back into the work. So, uh, and then also looking at how scientists thinks and how artists thinks, and there's a lot of similarities, actually. Yeah. That's wonderful insight. And now Naomi, please. Uh, so I've collaborated um, in several situations, um, sometimes with music, uh, sometimes with theater, um, and uh, in one case on a film. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting process. I, I don't, nat I, it doesn't come that naturally to me, I would say. I mean, I, I, in a certain way, I'm always collaborating with music, but it, because I listen to music when I work. Um, but um, to actually work with the work of a composer, uh, the, the question uh, becomes uh, sometimes, you know, the, uh, I guess, uh, which is more important, you know, which is sub sub subsidiary to which, which medium. Uh, and of course, the way I work, my medium is uh, paramount to, to me, you know. Uh, so in working with a composer, it's not really much of an issue because, uh, you know, uh, music comes through a different sense than uh, sight, you know, it comes through the ears. Uh, however, for example, collaborating with dance, uh, I collaborated with Margaret Jenkins, um, or with theater, uh, I collaborated with the work, Word for Word uh, company. Um, you really can't... Um, uh, pull the attention too much, you know, the, the, the whole thing has to work together rather than, you know, one piece of it sticking out as, you know, um, a predominant. Um, so, uh, you know, it's challenging. Uh, I also, uh, one of the things I really enjoy about um, uh, the collaborations I've done is that uh, the stage is a very large canvas. So, you know, it's much bigger than any painting I could make and I've always enjoyed working big. So that's one of the reasons I really love working with performance. Okay. Uh, now we are uh, moving into another topic and this topic is about uh, the art world. And uh, I want to combine it with the situation that we are in and uh, this is COVID and everybody this whole year and from the time the pandemic started, we started uh, talking and writing and hearing people say, oh, uh, take a look how many things are going to change. And uh, it also has revealed and exposed all the, um, all the 
dysfunction in our society, politics, and so forth. So uh, that brings me to the question, would anything be changed? And I want to zero in as particularly on uh, the experience of women, uh, women in the arts. So uh, my, uh, my uh, time framework for that is starting with 1971, when uh, Linda Nochlin has uh, written her landmark essay called Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And that was really uh, like a thunderbolt that hit the art world. And uh, since then, art history has been cha has changed. And then the other piece is uh, in the 1980s was a group of women who were dressed up as guerrilla girl, were, uh, guerrilla girls. They uh, base, uh, they worked out from uh, New York, and they were wear wearing masks as guerrillas. And they uh, did the studies and uh, published uh, what's going on in terms of women that they are not present in have a hard time being represented in galleries, museums, and so forth. Uh, this book has been uh, published, uh, republished, and with new data, and so uh, that. Over 25 years, we realized that there is not much that has changed. And uh, in a recent study, it shows that only 11% of uh, women artists are being acquired by museum. So I just want you to speak from your experience and uh, how do you view the progress of women in the arts in that time frame of 50 years? Uh, Leah, I will start with you. Oh, OK. And uh, please make uh, short comments because we are running out of time almost, okay? okay. So, uh, well, what I find is really interesting is that in textile field, all of a sudden, there's a lot of interest in textiles and a lot of interest in women, older women in textiles. It's amazing. So, uh, and this this is in the art world. So, to, <laughs> so uh, that, you know, that's a very interesting new movement. And it, it's so exciting for me, not necessarily it's me they're looking at, but just that they're beginning to look at that. And uh, shows, I mean, there are big shows everywhere where they're digging up work from the past of older women. And okay. Uh, how about you, Teddy? Can you comment on that? Well, I was going to say something similar because that's my focus as well. And I also think, um, I think there's, I think there's the question of whether we look at um, the changing art world in terms of the traditional male-defined painters and museums, or whether we look at the art world as, as I think is happening today. And I think COVID actually has has enhanced this, where we're out of the museums and we're into the galleries and now we're online. And I, and I see a lot of cross fertilization. I see people doing paint, incorporating stitch and incorporating thread and material and fabric um, into the paint. And I see there's, I think it's a really exciting time to feel that kind of cross collaboration. Um, and, and I agree with Leah, I think that it's an, there's for some reason with this resurgence, there's been a lot of acknowledgement of women in the arts in a different way, looking at it through a completely different lens. Okay, and Naomi, please, you next. You uh, have yeah, I, I don't know that I have very much to add uh, to what the other two have said. Um, you know, I think that uh, the, the lens, the cultural lens shifts around. Uh, at the moment, it seems to be falling on um, fi fiber arts, and I'm delighted. I don't know that it's falling on abstract painting, particularly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm waiting for that one. Uh, so, I am, you know, I, it's it's a mystery to me. You know, it's partly social forces and partly uh, activism that makes things happen. And uh, I'm, you know, looking forward to seeing what happens. Okay, now I have a question that also is a spin-off from the COVID uh, period. And uh, I will direct that question to Naomi. I won't give her any rest. <laughs> so uh, Naomi, uh, uh, imagine yourself being in this post-COVID era and uh, you, are you are inviting friends to dinner. And uh, 
I, uh, I would like you to invite some artists. Who would they be? And you can invite, uh, you can invite the dead artist or, uh, or live. And uh, as you know, uh, Elon Musk uh, has a key to the gates of heaven. So go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, you know, there are many, many that I would be interested in, in talking to. Um, you know, some of the, the ones that first come to mind is uh, um, Lee Krasner, um, Joan Mitchell, uh, although I actually uh, had a friend who was good friends with Joan Mitchell and she said she was impossible, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what she'd be like at a dinner. Uh, you know, uh, Monet, Picasso, um, Cezanne, um, Dora Mar. You make it manageable because the more you have, the less manageable okay. it's going to I'll be stop there. With, those, with those people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well, uh, anybody else uh, is planning a post-COVID dinner? Um, Leah, you know, I, I was going with contemporary artists. So I want to eat with Winifred Lutz, who's maybe not as well known, but she's a sculptor and fiber artist and envi does environmental installations. And she's um, uh, does phenomenal work and is fascinating. Sonia Clark. Um, I would love to eat with Sonia Clark and pick her brain. She's another fiber artist, but she uses lots of different kinds of materials and addresses current topics like race, culture, class, and history. Allison Saar, uh, yeah, and she can bring her mom too, Betty Saar. I would like to, to talk with him. I'd like to talk with Leah, you know, over dinner. I'd like to talk with my, uh, my art critique group. They're all, I always okay. enjoy being with yeah. them, and okay. I feel like we would... Yeah. Have great conversations. Now you have uh, Leah's email, so you can arrange it. Uh, <laughs> Leah, can, can you please uh, talk about uh, your selection? Uh, for me, I, I, I didn't select other artists. I just would like to meet with people that I, artists that I've known for many years and haven't seen somebody, you know, from Germany or Poland that I haven't had a chance to talk to. That's what I like. would like to bring in people from my past, and also young people, new people, mm -hmm. you know, with new ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, I miss uh, teaching, you know, young people from teaching. I, you know, I always had them in my life. And uh, so that would be the other thing too. Um, I had a, que a specific question for you, Leah, and this has to do with the celebration of uh, Bauhaus at 100, and where um, uh, Annie Albers in particular has been uh, featured a great deal. And he, she is, um, you know, she was quite a pioneer and did a lot of things during that time. And over the years, she has been forgotten. So uh, when we first talked, we had, uh, you have mentioned something about Annie Albers and the Bauhaus. So I just want to hear to you and it's a particular interest to me because I spent over two or three years just uh, working on Bauhaus and we did more than three exhibitions on the topic, so. Well, uh, I was going to talk about something broader than the Bauhaus because the Bauhaus had a very important influence in the whole art world, broadening things out into into uh, crafts and, and performance and all kinds of things. Uh, and it was an important influence, but my influence uh, was really came from more from uh, anthropology and from looking at broad other cultures that did art. Art and the history of textile art, which was, you never had that kind of history in, when you took an art history class. But so that was more an influence than the Bauhaus. But I was of course aware of all the things that were happening with Annie Albers and, and uh, you know, like she wasn't as noticed as Joseph Albers and all of that, but she was an important person and it was important influence in many schools. But for me, I was influenced more by Ed Ross back at Berkeley and uh, it, as I said, anthropology and uh, travels in many different countries looking at you know, the whole history of art, not just Western art. So 
Okay. Uh, you share some interest with Annie Albers because she was also interested in anthropology, many uh, cultures, and she traveled extensively with Joseph Albers in Latin America and so forth. Uh, so and now we come to the question that we cannot resist, and this is about um, building bridges and barriers and uh, breaking bar barriers. So. Um, uh, I am tying it in, uh, like breaking barriers and also building bridges, I'm tying it to the, a broad topic, which is about ageism. So how does it manifest itself in what, uh, what type of, uh, is, is ageism in your mind perceived as a barrier and is, the, is this a problem for women in the arts? Uh, Naomi, you want to answer uh, that oh, first? Okay. Oh, I didn't realize you were asking me, yeah. Um, so I think ageism takes many forms and it can be directed against youth as well as older people. So, uh, you know, there, there are um, definitely, you know, things that, opportunities that are not available to older people. Uh, but then again, you know, my first experience of ageism was when I was in my early forties and uh, I was introduced to Holly Solomon by somebody and, uh, you know, to look at my work. And uh, she's a dealer from New York who, you know, famous, uh, you know, had an amazing gallery and she would loved my work. And I thought, wow, this is great. And then she, she took a look at me and she said, but you're too old to promote. So, you know, I mean, and I was like 43 or something. So, I mean, that too old. So I think that, uh, you know, there are all kinds of prejudice and they can, it can find its way uh, to any age, <laughs> any sex, any race. And, uh, you know, I, in, you just have to power through and make your work and not worry about it. That's my experience. Thank you so much. Very inspiring. How about you, uh, Leah? Well, um, you know, as I said earlier on, within the field of textile and fiber, it's very interesting that it's old women that they're interested in. Uh, so that's a start, but uh, um, yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's there. Uh, maybe particularly in, in terms of, uh, you know, getting a gallery, you know, are you going to get a gallery when you're 80 years old? You know, well, you might, you might, if you, uh, if you're uh, Sheila Hicks and you, you know, your work is a lot of money, worth a lot of money. But for just even a, a well-known person, uh, they want somebody that has the energy to produce a lot of work, and they want it, you know, a lifetime. And they know you're not going to last very long, <laughs> so that it, you know. So I think there really is that kind of ageism that I see, uh, but I think I agree with Naomi, it's, it's all kinds of ages, you know, you can be too young, you know, so. How about you, Teddy? Thank you, Leah. I, I don't know that I have that much to add to what's already been said, but I, I will say because I came to practice art full time later in my life, that I feel that I've been very fortunate because I have gained a lot of acknowledgement and opportunities, um, even though I've started much later. I think I hold Louise Bourgeois in my in my mind and know that that she was a role model. You know, she didn't get acknowledged until she was what seventy or even into her eighties. Eighties. Yeah. So um, I think. But I think the real th thing is what Naomi said, which is that you have to focus on your work. You have to make the work. And that, that you know, we are compelled to make our work. And it doesn't matter what age we are. We still have to do it. OK. Uh, can we just, uh, in just like in one minute or something, try to talk about what type of uh, bridges we, we as women artists need to build and where do you want that bridge to take us? Uh, Naomi, are you ready? Oh, me again, huh? <laughs> well, we are going through a cycle here. Okay, uh, well, I mean, um, 
I think we're, we're all looking for an audience, you know, we want our work to be seen, we want to be in dialogue with uh, uh, people who care about art and who are interested in what we do and in our ideas and um, um, I have no special insights on how to go about doing that, unfortunately. And if any of you do, please, please tell me, you know, uh, you know, you just make your work and, uh, you get out and you talk about it and you meet people and, uh, opportunities come from that. So, um, those are the kinds of bridges that I'm building. Anybody else? Thank you. Uh, anybody else has something to add to it in terms of, uh, building bridges? I think the collaboration is really important working together with other people. Uh, I, I think that's, that's the way it's gonna go. <laughs> you know, that that's sort of a, instead of having to be the one star, you know, you're, you're working with other people and you're bringing ideas together. And I think that's what I see as bridges, you know, so. Okay, uh, Leah, do you have a comment? Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, Teddy. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to say as well, is that I think collaboration on all kinds of levels is is really, you know, I referenced it before, but uh, across disciplines, across techniques, um, across the arts, uh, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing performance and uh, as well as the visual arts. We're seeing um, installation and um, community engagement and interaction, and I think that that's, that's what creates the bridge. Okay, now I just and culture, want to, and culture. And now I want to turn to the audience and if anybody has a question or maybe you can uh, read from the chat. Okay, uh, if you don't, if uh, none of you have a question, I have the, my last question. And uh, this is, what do you want the audience to take away from today's uh, program discussion or from uh, what you heard? So my uh, response to that is, it uh, depends who you are. Uh, for the artists in the audience, I say, just keep doing it. And uh, that's the most important part of this. Uh, and then for uh, people who love art or collect art or whatever, um, my advice is to be open to all kinds of art from any person and any direction and, uh, and then follow your passion as far as what you respond to. And that's going to be what, what, what will um, enrich your life. Thank you. As always, inspiring. And uh, now, Teddy, can you, uh, uh, do you have any reflections? Stay curious, keep learning, and keep working. Yes. And now, Leah, you will be the last one. Okay. Well, uh, I, uh, I think uh, continuing to be experimental and continuing to look at changes and also uh, broader boundaries, uh, sort of hierarchies that you find, breaking them down, just, you know, and the collaboration, of course, I think. Well, so I will close it by thanking everybody for you, the artists who participated and for the audience who joined us. And uh, I think it's uh, really helped a lot to enrich the experience of the exhibition and dive deeper. And uh, it was uh, very enlightening and we all learned something from the works of art. And I know we could have spent so much more time on each of your work and really your philosophy of uh, uh, your approaches to art and your, uh, your life experience. So I really thank you very much for being here and supporting our program. And I finished on time. <laughs> <laughs> thank thank you. you very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.